RCEP, the world's largest free trade agreement, came into force on January the 1st. How effective will it be to boost trade and investment in the future? And in an exclusive interview, the Secretary General of the International Biathlon Union looks at how Beijing 2022 is on target with biathlon, a medley of skiing and shooting. Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. This is the first edition of The Point with me, Li Xin, in the year 2022. So first uh, of all, Happy New Year to all of you. And this is almost exactly the fifth year, fifth anniversary of the launch of our show. So this is a very special edition. Uh, now let's get down to business. The new year got off to a good start with the world's largest free trade agreement officially coming into force on its first day. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, encompasses the 10-member association of Southeast Asian nations, plus China, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. The deal slashes tariffs to zero on over 90% of the goods traded among members. Can the RCEP help keep trade and investment in the region stable in 2022? How will the deal impact global economics? And is there any ground for the concern that some members may benefit more than others? I'm pleased to be joined by Zhang Jinping, director of the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economy in Beijing, and from Singapore by Vana Riz Chan, vice chairman of the board of directors at the Cambodian Institute for Strategic Studies. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point and Happy New Year. Now, the RCEP covers a market of over 2 billion people. That's nearly a third of the world's population. Its combined GDP is about 30% of the world's total, worth over 26 trillion US dollars. So let me go to Vanareth Chan first. Over the next 20 years, as I said, the deal will reduce to zero the tariffs on as much as 90% of the goods traded among the 15 signatories. How will that affect trade and investment in the region? Thank you and Happy New Year. Uh, this is a new chapter uh, for the regional economy, especially in the context of uh, post-COVID-19 economic recovery. So RCEP is widely perceived across the region, especially in Southeast Asia, as a new catalyst uh, for uh, recovery. And of course, uh, we expect to see more uh, investment and trade flows across the region through the elimination of tariff barrier to 90%, even more than 90% and a liberalization of uh, trade in uh, services uh, more than 60 percent so that that is a gradual process of implementation of RCEP uh, over the next two decades so now we have six ASEAN member states already ratified it means that they they start implementing from from this year from this month onwards and uh, three more ASEAN member states Indonesia Malaysia Philippines going to ratify and it, it takes 60 days for them to implement Myanmar is after after RCEP because of uh, after the coup, there's no parliament uh, in Myanmar to ratify this agreement. So uh, by and large in Southeast Asia, I think they, 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 they embrace this uh, a new momentum and they, they hope to see more economic opportunity to be uh, a stamp uh, from this RCEP. And, and also they wish to export more agricultural products mm -hmm. to uh, RCEP member countries, especially China. You know, China is a big consumer market now for ASEAN uh, products. So that is a great opportunity uh, for New Year uh, uh, 2022. And this is uh, a great uh, a kind of uh, momentum uh, for the regional cooperation on trade and investment corporations. Hmm. Mr. Zhang, as the world's largest trade deal, how do you foresee the RCEP shaping the global economics in the near term? RCEP, uh, as the largest uh, uh, integrated market in the world, uh, will pr provide a new economic driving force uh, for not only RCEP members, but also for global economy, uh, especially facing with uh, pandemic uh, and uh, uh, actually global economic recovery uh, is not so stable. Uh, RCEP provided a new market uh, expectation 
just because uh, tariff and non-tariff marriage reduction, uh, you may find that uh, actually trade creation effect and investment creation effect job opportunities will be provided uh, in the region. And then, you know, today global, uh, for global trade, uh, more than two thirds of, uh, you know, global trade conducted by global value chain. RCEP provided new rules and regulations, uh, including you know e-commerce and you know uh, uh, P, uh, uh, property prop, uh, property right you know protection mechanism mm -hmm. and you know uh, uh, competition policies something like that. So we can see that mm -hmm. in the future, global supply chain will be closer uh, more. We will be closer and closer, mm -hmm. and then all of economies will get new economic driving force. Hopefully, hopefully. Um, Mr. Chan in Singapore, the RCEP was launched, was proposed by ASEAN in the year 2012, and it took eight years of negotiations to be finally inked before it came into effect uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, in the beginning, it was only the initial 10 ASEAN members, but later it expanded and diversify to include, as I said, China, Japan, ROK, Australia, and New Zealand. So what was the original idea behind the proposal of such a free trade agreement? And what's the idea behind expanding it to include more regional countries? Yes, uh, you're right, uh, mentioning that uh, it is ASEAN-driven process, right? Uh, uh, because ASEAN economies are very open economies. And they, they share a common vision of uh, openness and inclusiveness. So outward looking uh, is the kind of economic strategy of ASEAN. And ASEAN economy, frankly speaking, is reliant on external markets more than internal markets. Only 25% of intra-regional trade among ASEAN member states. So it means that we do trading with uh, outside the region more than within the region. And China, Japan, Korea, or Australia, New Zealand uh, are, are key uh, trading partners, right, uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Mm. So that is the, the strategic intention: is for economic survival of ASEAN, it needs to expand to the wider regions uh, through this uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership. Of course, they all have bilateral FTA with all these five uh, uh, OSEP members, right. uh, but. The OSEP uh, give uh, a new uh, higher level, level playing field in terms of standards, uh, compliance, uh, facilitation measure, and the removal of barriers, including uh, the barriers to investment flow. And as uh, the previous panel mentioned about the e-commerce, uh, competition, uh, uh, intellectual property rights, those are the, the new elements that will boost uh, regional uh, economic integration and, of course, a regional production network and supply chain. Mm. So that is something that ASEAN is looking forward to. Mm. Let's focus a little bit on the specific case of Cambodia as a representative of uh, ASEAN members, a country which I have very fond memories uh, because I visited in person and had a great time. So uh, Cambodia has called the RCEP a victory of multilateralism and free trade. It projects that the uh, RCEP will boost its GDP by 2%, will boost exports by over 7% and invest investment by 24%, especially in the agricultural sector. However, there have been commentaries which say that countries such as Cambodia, which are less developed in the bloc, can be eroded by the deal and benefit not as much as countries which are more developed, such as China or Japan or the ROK. Uh, what is your understanding of the situation for countries such as Cambodia? Well, uh, OSEP was uh, initiated and uh, boosted by Cambodia as a chair of ASEAN. 20, uh, 10 years ago, 2012. Mm. And now it is a time for Cambodia to take our chairmanship this year and to launch this uh, OSEP, which is one of the key deliverables 10 years ago uh, when Cambodia was the chair of ASEAN. So this is something that we need to take note of. And uh, Cambodia believe that OSEP provide a win-win cooperation, small, big, medium-sized, uh, you know, a different economic level uh, development will all benefit from, from the regional uh, trade deal uh, because uh, we believe in uh, regional economic integration 
the more we integrate, uh, the more opportunities we can generate. The greater independence, uh, the more opportunities for the people. So we believe that uh, the, this kind of uh, regional integration is, is a part of the DNA <laughs> of the survival of a small economy uh, like Cambodia. And, and it's not only Cambodia, uh, you know, across Southeast Asia, uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, economic strategy for them to survive is to deepen their regional and international integration. Mm. So OSEP, of course, it depends on the capacity of the, of the country in terms of competition, uh, competitiveness, uh, production capacity, and how they can uh, optimize or utilize this regional trading. So down the road, also also mentioned about technical cooperation. So down the road, I think more developed countries and economy can help country like Cambodia, which is less developed, to build their production capacity to offer more technical cooperation so that everyone will fairly benefit from also. Mr. Zhang, I would like to get your perspective on this because there have been comments that countries such as China especially, but of course other more developed economies such as Japan and ROK are set to benefit more from the deal than the less developed countries in the bloc. What is your understanding of the situation? Uh, in fact, uh, according to uh, you know, quantitative estimation uh, made by economic model, uh, all of the economies can benefit from you know, uh, the integrated market. Uh, of course, uh, Japan as a developed economies, due to their you know uh, brand management, uh, their transnational uh, co uh, corporations competition uh, uh, capacity, and meanwhile, uh, Japanese economies already internationalized. Uh, so I, I think that uh, of course Japan uh, can get uh, much more benefit from that market. Of course, uh, South Korea. Uh, nowadays already becomes, you know, developed economies, its per capita GDP more than uh, 30, uh, uh, actually uh, 30,000 US dollars. Meanwhile, uh, South Korea today already becomes a very, very open economy uh, in uh, its age, uh, region. Mm -hmm. Also, it, it can benefit from, you know, global supply chain. China has the lar largest economies in Asia and the second one in the world. Uh, of course, also uh, can uh, get a lot. That, uh, of course, I think that for other economies, uh, due to their economic scale, uh, of course, if you look at the total, you know, benefit, maybe not so, you know, uh, large than China get one. However, for those small economies, uh, their, you know, growth rate also will be, you know, positive. I think. All right, we are going to leave it there. Thank you so much to my guests, Zhang Jianping, Director of the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economy, and Vana Riz Chian, Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors at the Cambodian Institute for Strategic Studies.